Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Western Heritage Center. Uh, my name is Kevin Coy. Thank you, Herb. <laughs> um, my name is Kevin Coyster. I'm the Executive Director of the Western Heritage Center, and I want to welcome you to another high noon program. Uh, of course, we have Christian Coppage from uh, the Yellowstone County Museum talking about the Winchester, the making of a Western icon. Uh, I wanted to announce we have a couple other programs uh, that are pretty exciting also. On September 15, the third Thursday at high noon, we have John Clayton from Red Lodge, the author, who will be speaking about the program Natural Rivals, John Muir, Gifford Pitchow, and the Creation of America's Public Lands. On Thursday, October 6, we have a celebrity here, uh, Tom Murphy, the international wildlife photographer. Have you ever seen the uh, PBS program? I think it's their most popular, Yellowstone in Winter. He is the uh, featured photographer who sleeps in the middle of the wilderness, in the middle of winter in Yellowstone. He will be here talking about wild Yellowstone and the photography of Tom Murphy. Uh, and then on October 20, the third Thursday in October, Dr. Emily Hart will be talking about Montana Women in Leadership, the story of the National Women's Conference of 1977. I think we're pretty much covering the basis for everybody's interest at this point, from photography to wildlife to women's history to public land history. Uh, but today we have a really unique program on the history of the Winchester Rifle. Uh, Christian Coppage, is that, is that how you say it? Coppage, yes. Coppage, okay, I just <laughs> I realized. Uh, is a fifth generation Montana, originally from Denton, uh, which is a small farming community in central Montana. Uh, Christian moved to Billings in 2014 to attend MSU Billings, where he earned his bachelor's degree in history. After graduating in 2018, Christian began working as a curator uh, for the Yellowstone County Museum up on the hill here. He currently serves as a board member for the Friends of Pompey's Pillar and is a strong proponent of lifelong learning since it provides all of us with the opportunity to discover, grow, and improve. Uh, without further ado, Winchester, the making of Western Icon. Thank you, Christian. Well, thank you, Kevin, and thank you for the warm welcome here today. Um, I'm actually pretty pleased with the turnout. There's a lot of people here, so uh, uh, thank you so much. Um, I'd like to thank the Western Heritage Center for inviting me here today, and they've had such an awesome, uh, they've had such awesome programs lately, so I'm kind of nervous. I'm hoping I can live up to some of them. <laughs> um, so as Kevin said, my name's Christian Coppage, for those of you who do not know me. And uh, I've been working at the Yellowstone County Museum for a little under five years now. And uh, one of the projects I was in charge of last year was the uh, revamp of our entire firearms collection. So uh, I developed five new exhibitions in the span of that year. And this is probably my favorite one here. It's called the Winchester Rifle Icon of the West. Um, it was a really fun exhibit to put together and research. I learned an awful lot. And uh, I'm excited for today's presentation because it allows me the opportunity to explore some of the ideas that were kind of uh, necessarily constrained by the exhibit. So uh, the primary aim of this presentation is to answer a rather seemingly simple question, and that is how and why did Winchester rifles become a symbol of the American West? Uh, to answer this question, uh, I'll the presentation will be in four parts. Uh, first, I'll explore the technological development of repeating rifles, and then we will discuss the uh, rise of the Winchester Repeating Arms Company and their historical connections to the American West. Uh, the third part will explore some of the prominence of depictions in uh, some popular culture of the 19th century, namely Pulp Fiction and, uh, and uh, Wild West shows of the era. And then rounding out the fourth part here will be a, kind of a discussion of the depiction of Winchesters in Western film, and then some of the deliberate actions by Winchester Company to kind of strengthen their connection to the West kind of in the post-World War I. All right, um, I do have to make one kind of quick uh, disclaimer, for lack of a better term. Uh, there will be some uh, depictions of rifles being used 
uh, mostly for the killing of Native Americans. Um, it's nothing graphic or overt, but I just need to kind of warn you that that is part of this history, unfortunately. Um, and I just need to say, you know, for clarity that neither myself nor the Yellowstone County Museum uh, in any way, shape, or form uh, endorse violence against Native Americans. So with uh, all the introductions out of the way, as well as disclaimers, let's get started. Just give me one second. All right, so like any other technology, Winchester rifles are part of a much longer history of innovation and development. Firearms underwent rapid changes throughout the 19th century, progressing from flintlock and caplock mechanisms all the way to repeating and semi-automatic systems. Before delving into the history of Winchester Company, the story of the repeating rifle begins with an obscure inventor named Walter Hunt. So Walter Hunt was a machinist and inventor from Martinsburg, New York. Despite being lesser known, Hunt is credited with inventing several machines and tools that most of us are familiar with today. Some of his inventions include the rotary street sweeper, the lock stitch sewing machine, and the humble safety pin. Most notable, however, are two of Hunt's contributions to firearms technology, the rocket ball and the volitional repeater. In 1848, Hunt designed a rudimentary cartridge which he called the rocket ball. This ammunition was a hollow conical bullet filled with black powder and sealed with a cork stopper. The stopper had a small hole punched in the middle so a spark could enter and ignite the powder. The most apparent issue with the rocket ball was that it did not work in any firearm system available at the time. As such, Hunt began working on a new rifle system that could use the new ammunition. In 1849, Hunt designed what he called the volitional repeater, which is widely considered the first repeating rifle. The volitional repeater uses a lever action system, was chambered for 54 caliber rocket balls, and featured a 12 round tubular magazine. While crude in many respects, this rifle was a pioneering effort which laid the groundwork for many subsequent repeating rifles. While the volitional repeater was a promising idea, Hunt lacked the funding to further develop his new rifle. As such, it never saw mass production and only one prototype exists today. Hunt sold his patent to Lewis Jennings, a fellow machinist from New York, who made some minor improvements to the repeating mechanism before selling the design to a hardware merchant named Cortland C. Palmer. Palmer had very little experience with firearms, but saw the money-making potential of the new rifle. So Palmer entered a partnership with Horace Smith and Daniel Wesson, the duo that would go on to make popular handguns, and they modified the volitional repeater for mass market sale. Smith and Wesson improved the receiver and loading mechanisms and patented their new firearm, which they called the volcanic lever action rifle, in 1854. Despite the improvements, the new rifle was not ready for mass production or sale. The most apparent problem was the ammunition, which generated low velocities, uh, sometimes ignited prematurely and caused corrosion in the magazines and barrels. <coughs> the rights and designs to the rifle were sold by Palmer, Smith & Wesson to a group of investors from New York and Connecticut. The new business that acquired the patent was established in 1855 and named the Volcanic Repeating Arms Company after its flagship rifle. The following year, one of the Connecticut-based investors named Oliver Winchester assumed management of the company. Winchester began his career in 1830, opening and running a haberdashery in Baltimore, Maryland. He sold his store in 1847 and moved to New Haven, Connecticut to start a dress shirt manufacturing business. The new business made Winchester wealthy, and he turned his focus away from managing to investing. Despite knowing very little about firearms, Winchester had an eye for opportunity, and he marshaled together a group of investors to purchase what would become known as the Volcanic Repeating Arms Company. <clears throat> when Winchester became president of the company in 1856, the new business was on a downturn, still plagued by faulty ammunition and difficulty marketing the new rifle. The VRAC was declared insolvent in February of 1857 due to poor sales and abandonment by other investors. The next month, Oliver Winchester was assigned all assets of the company and became its sole owner. Winchester launched his new business under the name the New Haven Arms Company and found a new lead for his factory. 
At the recommendation of Smith & Wesson, Winchester hired a young gunsmith named Benjamin Tyler Henry to serve as the factory superintendent. Prior to the New Haven Arms Company, Henry worked at the Springfield Armory and several other small independent gun shops. Henry scrapped the old ammunition and began working on a new rimfire cartridge in 1858. Now the concept of rimfire ammunition had been around since about the mid 1840s, but Henry's credited with the first large caliber cartridge suitable for mass production. Henry designed a 44 flat cartridge and reconfigured the volcanic rifle for the new ammunition. Henry filed for patents in 1860, and the following year, the Henry rifle was released as the first practical mass market repeating rifle. And here it is. The Henry debuted at the onset of the American Civil War in 1861. Oliver pitched the rifle to the Union Army in hopes that, his, in hopes that he could land a military contract. The New Haven Arms Company furnished several Henrys for the Army to test, but when Winchester's contract bid was ultimately declined. Despite rejecting the Henry for widespread adoption, the Army still purchased about 2,000 rifles and issued them to a handful of select regiments. The merits of the Henry spread by word of mouth, and many Union and Confederate soldiers purchased the rifle using their own money. A mere 14,000 Henry rifles were produced between 1861 and 1866 and Henry's were state-of-the-art firearms, and as such were rather expensive, costing as much as $40, which adjusted for today's money is around $1,200. <clears throat> for settlers headed west during and after the Civil War, the, the Henry was financially out of reach, which forced them to rely on older or cheaper firearms. Despite being relatively rare in the region, the Henry still became closely associated with the American West. Accuracy, reliability, and a high rate of fire positioned the Henry as a mythical weapon of the frontier. Native Americans often called the Henry the spirit gun and paid top dollar to obtain it. Arguably the most famous use of the Henry in the West is credited to lawman Stephen Venard, who confronted three highwaymen in Nevada City, California. Despite being outnumbered and outgunned, Venard used his Henry rifle to dispatch all three outlaws. The West is where Winchester's repeating rifles earned their storied reputation. They were fast, accurate, and unlike many firearm systems of this era, they were especially dependable. This reputation, established with the company's first rifle, would characterize many of Winchester's future products. Subsequent Winchester rifles became associated with the American West, largely through stories and imagery beyond the company's control. So coinciding with westward expansion, Oliver Henry renamed his company the Winchester Repeating Arms Company and released the first rifle to bear his name, the Winchester Model 1866. The Model 66 featured several key improvements over the Henry. <coughs> Nelson King, the company's new lead gunsmith, invented an improved loading mechanism for the rifle. King developed a side frame loading door, which made the reloading process easier and faster and minimized the potential for dirt and debris to enter the weapon. The Model 1866 also featured a wooden forearm to protect the user's hand from the heat of the barrel. These improvements would be included in all subsequent Oliver Winchester rifles. <clears throat> Winchester pushed the Model 1866 as a military arm to both the United States and foreign governments. The United States rejected the Model 1866 in favor of the breech-loading Springfield rifles, but Winchester fared much better overseas. 6,000 units were sold to the French government during the Franco-Prussian War, and 50,000 rifles and carbines were sold to the Ottoman Empire during the buildup to the Russo-Turkish War. In North America, Winchester Company put little effort into marketing their gun to civilians. Due to the lack of any substantial advertising, images and associations from outside the company established the Model 1866 as a symbol of the American West. The Model 66 was released as a time of great turbulence on the frontier with increased traffic along wagon trains, leading to confrontations and outright conflicts between settlers and Plains Indian tribes. Through these conflicts, the Model 1866 became popular among both Native Americans and settlers who desired a rifle that was rugged and dependable. There are over 100,000 Model 66 rifles produced between 1866 and 1873. 
Despite its popularity, many users criticized the ammunition, which was underpowered when compared to that of breech-loading rifles. In the years that followed the release of the Model 1866, Winchester Company worked to improve both their rifles and ammunition, and in the process, made one of the most recognizable and enduring Western icons. So in 1873, Winchester Company produced the 4440, which was the first Winchester centerfire cartridge. Centerfire ammunition has many advantages over rimfire counterparts, most notable being the stronger cartridge casings, which allows for a larger powder charge. Both the Henry and the Model 1866 used 44 caliber bullets with a 26 grain powder charge, while the 4440, as the name suggests, used a 44 caliber bullet with a 40 grain charge. Winchester then developed the Model 1873, the company's first centerfire rifle, and one of the most popular lever action rifles ever produced. Since the new cartridges generated greater chamber pressure, the Model 1873 featured a receiver made of steel, which was both stronger and lighter than brass receivers used in the previous models. Perhaps more so than any other Winchester rifle, the Model 1873 is often seen as synonymous with the West. The Model 73 was robust and reliable, it could fire 15 rounds within the span of a minute, and was effective in ranges up to 150 yards. The carbine version was most popular, it was compact and could comfortably be stored in a saddle case. Shortly following the Model 73's release, Colt and Remington began making handguns chambered for Winchester's 4440. This allowed the same ammunition to be used in both a rifle and sidearm. William F. Cody, better known as Buffalo Bill, was a military scout turned stage performer and an avid patron of Winchester Company. During his scouting and hunting exploits, Cody claimed to have carried a, 40, a Model 73 and two 4440 Colt revolvers. Cody praised the Model 73 in this correspondence to Oliver Winchester in 1875. <coughs> I have been using and have thoroughly tested your latest improved rifle. Allow me to say that I have tried and used nearly every kind of gun made in the United States. And for general hunting or Indian fighting, I pronounce your improved Winchester the boss. While in the Black Hills last summer, I happened upon a bear and Mr. Bear made for me. And I am certain had I not been armed with one of your repeating rifles, I would now be in the happy hunting grounds. The bear was not 30 feet from me when he charged, but he, before he could reach me, I had 11 bullets in him, which was a little more lead than he could comfortably digest. Believe me, you have the most complete rifle now made. The quote always cracks me up, Cody's <laughs> silly, <laughs> for lack of a better term. All right, so William Cody was instrumental in popularizing Winchester rifles, but I will talk about him and his work a little bit later. Despite his popularity and technological achievements, the rifle is still lacking in overall power compared to many of its single shot contemporaries. In the year of the Model 73's release, the US Army adopted the 4570 ammunition as their new standard. The 4570 cartridge is almost twice the length as, length as the 4440 and boasted effective ranges up to 600 yards, four times the distance that of the 73. Not to be outdone, Winchester sent his gunsmiths back to the drawing board to develop a new rifle that could handle larger ammunition. A mere three years later, Winchester Company released the Winchester Model 1876. The Model 76 was largely an iterative improvement over the 73, which increased the strength and size of the receiver to accommodate larger cartridges. Right up here you see a side-by-side, -side, the 73 on the bottom and the 76 on the top. They largely look the same, but the construction of the 76 is obviously quite a lot bigger. <clears throat> the Model 76 is chambered for 4575, the largest Winchester cartridge at the time of its release. Rather than being especially popular or widespread in the West, the Model 76 became most closely associated with big game hunting. As we all know now probably, between 1871 and 1883, commercial hunting had nearly driven bison of the Great Plains to extinction. The Model 1876 had powerful ammunition and a long effective range, and was often used by bison hunters alongside Sharps, Springfield, and Remington rifles. The Model 1876 pictured here was owned by John Henry Dover, a homesteader who settled near Billings in 1882. Dover purchased the rifle for hunting bison, but by the time he arrived in the area, he found the herds had largely been wiped out. 
The model 1876 is often synonymous with Theodore Roosevelt, who, being a prolific hunter, cited the model 76 as his favorite hunting rifle. Despite spending most of his life on the East Coast, Roosevelt is often seen as a prominent figure of the American West. He's, of course, credited with establishing Yellowstone National Park. He owned cattle ranches in North Dakota and spent a great deal of his leisure time in hunting and traveling the West. He also wrote one of the, arguably one of the first histories of westward expansion, a two-volume opus titled The Winning of the West. So following the Model 1876, Winchester Company didn't make a new lever action rifle for almost a decade. Instead, experimenting with single shot and bolt action rifles. In 1883, Winchester Company hired talented gun designer John M. Browning as their new lead gunsmith. In the closing decades of the 19th century, Browning produced many popular rifles for Winchester Company, including the Model 1886, 1880, 1892, 1894, and the 1895. Following this run of firearms, Winchester Company largely shifted their focus away from their staple lever action rifles in favor of other firearm systems. So in the 19th century, Winchester Company made few, if any, attempts to cultivate the connection between their rifles and westward expansion. Winchesters were cutting edge and therefore expensive. As such, Winchester was more concerned with selling their rifles to governments rather than courting the people of the frontier, who were largely agrarian and of modest means. The connection between Winchester and the West was built through their use by individuals and in events significant to Western history, but this was not the only means through which this connection was drawn. Popular fiction of the 19th century played a key role in cementing the bond between Winchester and the American West. <clears throat> so Western fiction started more or less concurrently with westward expansion. In the latter half of the 19th century, the dime novel became an exceedingly popular form of entertainment across the United States and parts of Europe. The mechanization of printing, coupled with the rise in literacy rates, created a new demand for inexpensive reading material. These cheaply produced, sensational stories began as early as 1860 and became most popular in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The dime novel catered to a primarily male audience and was especially favored by the youth of the urban industrial East. Stories often depicted exciting exploits like military campaigns, crime fighting, romance, and espionage but the most popular dime novels were tales about the frontier. The Western setting provided an excellent theater for drama, danger, and most importantly, action. It was here in print where many of the tropes typical of Western fiction were established. Fringe buckskin outfits, gunslinging heroes and heroines, and the all-important triumph of justice over lawlessness. Generally, the audiences of the Western dime novels gravitated towards the connections gravitated towards stories connected to real-life Westerners like Jesse James, Kit Carson, and Wild Bill Hickok. Despite being based on real t people, the stories were almost entirely fictitious. One individual who was subject of countless dime novels was one Buffalo Bill Cody. See, I told you we'd get back to him. <laughs> Cody was a minor historical figure and a kind of a jack-of-all-trades during his time in the West. He worked with brief stints as a farmer, trapper, Pony Express rider, and stagecoach driver. <clears throat> Cody garnered a notable reputation as both an army scout and hunting guide, but was introduced to the public by several dime novels written by his friend, Ned Buntline. Buffalo Bill took up writing his own novels for a time, but his popularity skyrocketed under the authorship of Prentice Ingram, a prolific dime novelist of the 19th century. Ingram is credited with writing over 600 dime novels, 200 of which feature Buffalo Bill. Ingram's Buffalo Bill series placed the titular character in many dangerous situations where he had to escape using his cunning, wits, and of course, his trusty Winchester rifle. One such exploit, Ingram describes the protagonist's aptitude with his prized weapon. Nearer and nearer came the rushing band of Indians, for what had 200 mounted warriors to fear from one man? Nearer and nearer until presently, Buffalo Bill was seen to raise his rifle, and a perfect stream of fire seemed to flow out the muzzle while shots came in rapid succession. It was a Winchester rifle, and Buffalo Bill had been testing it thoroughly. Down in the dust had gone several of their number. With a wild, defiant war cry, Buffalo Bill wheeled and rode away, loading his mattress rifle as he ran. 
While readers responded well to the stories and characters, the dime novel was lacking in a key component that would come to define Western fiction, and that was visual spectacle. <laughs> so concurrent with the dime novel was the Wild West show. <laughs> These shows began in the early 1870s on stage and later evolved into open air productions. Wild West shows fe commonly featured cowboys, Native Americans, reenactments, wildlife, and trick shooting. The most successful and popular of these acts was established by Cody. So capitalizing on his dime novel success, Cody began his own Wild West show in 1873 called The Buffalo Bill Combination in partnership with Wild Bill Hickok and Texas Jack Omohundro. During the same time, Cody served as a scout for the Army between 1872 and 1876, which lent credibility to his stage show and Western persona. The Buffalo Bill combination was rife with nonsensical plots and real bad acting, but the public responded well to this small, romanticized gl glimpse of the West. Cody's success in the literature and on stage allowed him to start his own business in 1882, which he called Buffalo Bill's Wild West. This traveling open air show would bring the colorful characters and stories of the West to audiences the world over. It is here that much of the popular imagery associated with the West was established and later emulated and expanded by film in the following century. As mentioned earlier, Cody was especially fond of Winchesters and naturally these rifles made their way into his show. Interspersed between acts, Cody would add brief interludes of trick riding, roping, and feats of marksmanship. Even though Winchester Company did not endorse or promote Buffalo Bill's Wild West, these trick shooting segments almost exclusively used Winchester rifles and ammunition. The accuracy and rapid fire of these rifles made for an energetic spectacle that would often be the highlight of the production. It was here on Buffalo Bill's stage where Winchester rifles became rec recognized by the public as a fundamental element of the Western experience. All right, we're in the home stretch now. <laughs> so as alluded to earlier, Winchester Company had largely shifted away from lever action rifles at the turn of the century. Instead, the company explored other firearms, namely bolt action rifles and self-loading or what we call semi-automatic mechanisms. When the United States entered the First World War in 1917, Government arsenals were not equipped to meet the new demands for rifles and ammunition and began outsourcing to private arms manufacturers. Winchester was awarded a massive contract to supply M1917 Enfield rifles and 30-06 cartridges for the U.S. Army. The First World War was much greater than any conflict of the 19th century, and Winchester factories were not prepared for the new demands. To keep up with production, Winchester took out substantial loans to expand their factories. And by war's end, Winchester Company employed 17,500 people in a 3 million square foot facility. Finally, Winchester Company had achieved their longtime goal of contracting with the US military. Following the war, however, Winchester faced many financial hurdles that require inventive solutions to overcome. Winchester came out of the First World War with expanded production capabilities, a mountain of debt from that expansion, and overall less demand for their products. In the 19th century, Winchester's association with the American West was largely a product of happenstance rather than any deliberate action by the company. After the war, however, Winchester Company would devote great effort to cultivating the link between their products and the West. Beginning in the 1880s, Winchester Company began selling a yearly calendar as part of a promotional campaign. These calendars prominently featured Winchester rifles, usually in outdoor and recreational settings. In the early 1900s, Winchester hired Philip R. Goodwin, who was a contemporary and friend of Charles M. Russell, to provide artwork for these calendars. In 1919, as part of a rebranding effort, Winchester commissioned Goodwin to create their first official logo. And the result was this image, informally known as the Winchester Armed Rider which evoked the American cowboy, one of the most immediately recognizable figures of the West. Winchester used this image and its derivations in its marketing for well over a century. Pictured here is the, up top is the logo from their webpage just a few months ago, and cases of 30-06 and 22 long ammunition that I had purchased not too long ago either. 
Even today, the armed rider logo is still prominently featured on Winchester products and marketing material. With the exception of their iconic rifles, this is far and away the longest standing and most recognizable symbol for Winchester Company. The same year as their logo, Winchester began using the phrase, the gun that won the West, as their new advertising slogan. First appearing in 1919 Winchester catalog, the phrase overtly references the company's legacy and connection to the West. Unlike the armed rider image, Winchester Company quietly dropped the gun that won the West tagline sometime in the mid-1900s due to more of its obvious, <laughs> obvious negative connotations. It may seem that this rebranding effort was Winchester Company simply celebrating their legacy, but there was one major outside motivator which may have influenced Winchester to embrace its connection to the West, and this was the growing popularity of Western film. Beginning in 1903 with The Great Train Robbery, directed by Edwin S. Porter, the Western would come to dominate the silent film era and remain a staple of the silver screen for well over seven decades. Unlike other films of this era, even other action-oriented films, firearms were a fundamental component of the Western experience. They were depicted as tools for dispensing justice, enacting revenge, and subduing savagery. The Western served as a medium through which the public became more familiar with late 19th century firearms and would play a substantial role in popularizing Winchester rifles in the 20th century. The relationship between Winchester Company and Western film was by no means one-sided. Winchester developed the five-in-one blank, especially for use on film sets. Now a blank is a cartridge with no bullet and a relatively small powder charge, just enough to make a convincing sound and a plume of smoke. The cartridge would, could be used interchangeably in two Winchester rifles and three Colt revolvers, hence the name five and one. Filmmakers often gravitated towards using Colt and Winchester arms for their films since they could easily obtain blanks for them, making Colt and Winchester somewhat overrepresented in early films. So coinciding with their prominent depiction in film, many classic Winchester models saw a pronounced uptick in sales. Between 1900 and 1909, Winchester Company sold 234,050 Model 73 rifles. This figure constitutes well over one third of all Model 73s produced. Early Westerns heavily featured the models 1892 and 1894 simply because they were abundant and looked right for their respective role. Later, the Model 1892 became associated with John Wayne, who used variations of the rifle for the better part of his career. The Model 1894 proved to be the most popular of Winchester's lever action rifles, with over 7.5 million units produced between 1894 and 2006. Motivated by the success of their rifles on the big screen and in sales, Winchester Company developed and released modernized versions of their classic models. The Winchester Model 53 and 55 were released in 1924, both of which were based on designs from the late 19th century. Despite some renewed interest, Winchester Company found itself struggling throughout the 1920s. Strain from the wartime loans and reduced demand for their products left Winchester Company nearing bankruptcy. Winchester tried to make use of its expanded facilities and workforce by becoming a general goods manufacturer. Alongside its firearms, Winchester began producing household appliances, roller skates, cutlery, and countless other products. For these general goods, Winchester's advertising claimed they were as good as the gun. This measure kept Winchester afloat for several years, but the effect of seeing kitchen appliances and children to children's toys bearing the same name as rifles and shotguns cheapened the allure of Winchester, and sales subsequently plummeted. In 1931, due to diminished sales and the onset of the Great Depression, the Winchester Repeating Arms Company went into receivership and was purchased by the Western Cartridge Company at a bankruptcy auction. During the under the leadership of the WCC, Winchester continued to make rifles and ammunition, but the company and its products would never again achieve the popularity they had in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. <clears throat> Winchester rifles were innovative firearms and commonly credited as the first mass market repeating rifles. Winchester Company's most in iconic firearms came about during the settlement of the American West and largely became associated with this historic era. The dime novels and Wild West shows of the late 19th century further popularized Winchester rifles and strengthened their link to the West in the public consciousness. 
film of the early 20th century was largely dominated by the Western. These films heavily featured Winchester rifles as part of their aesthetic and action set pieces and were instrumental in making Winchester a household name. The 20th century also saw a struggling Winchester company modify its marketing, imagery, and products to reflect a strong connection with the American West. It was through this combination of history, fiction, and cultivated connection that the Winchester rifle is recognized as an immutable icon of the West. There we go. <laughs> well. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for coming today. Um, well, I kind of blew through it, didn't I? Uh, <laughs> well, we have some time for questions. Does anybody have any questions for me? Yes, sir. Did you see the 1894 was in production for 112 years? Uh, yes, that's right. It's, it's uh, far and away its most popular rifle. And it was uh, one of the few that could handle uh, smokeless powder, which is more explosive than uh, black powder. So it's been popular for a very long time. Yes, sir. So when did Henry switch to Winchester, and why were they more successful later on? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, Henry, it was shortly after the release of the rifle. Um, he was replaced by Nelson King, I think, like immediately after its release. And the reason being is there was a, a patent dispute. So what happens with well, what Winchester did, which was kind of scummy, um, was Henry filed for the patent but the patent was owned by Winchester Company. And Henry only got a certain amount of money, you know, just his annual salary, even though the, the Henry was fairly popular. Um, and so he left shortly after that. And he worked in several independent gun shops after that, but never anything big again. Does that answer your question? Well, it seems like Henry is still very popular. That's right. Um, so there's a. There's a new Henry Repeating Arms Company, and that was established in, I believe it was 1996. So it really doesn't have a relation other than name to Henry. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh my goodness. What, what, what happened to Browning? To Browning? Yeah. Uh, so Browning went on to be a very popular gun designer. Uh, everybody kind of knows his association with the Second World War. Uh, he designed the Colt 1911, uh, the Browning automatic rifle, and the M2. And, Tons of other ones. The M5 shotgun is one of his popular ones too. So, yeah, he had a long story career after Winchester. So we had a young company. Uh, yes, yes, he did. He had one with his brother. So. Uh, you in the back corner here. What uh, just an estimate? What That's a good question too. I don't have like a concrete figure, but from what I've heard, it was probably less than 20% of guns on the Indian side were repeating rifles. They had a Native American guns kind of ran the gambit. It was everything from trade rifles from the late 1700s all the way up to repeating rifles. So I unfortunately don't have an accurate figure for you. Yes, sir. You, uh, your presentation sort of concentrated on Yes. They never really did get into handguns. That was, you know, that was already pretty well saturated by Smith and Wesson, uh, Remington, Colt, obviously. So they never really, as far as I know, they've never gotten into handguns. Maybe they have recently, but that's a whole different discussion. <laughs> when did they start producing shotguns? Oh, let's see. I think their first shotgun was the Model 1888. So it was somewhere in the middle of their popular production run. Can you hear me now? Anyone else? When yes? did they start putting scopes on guns? You know, when you said that they could shoot 150 yards and then 600 yards? Ooh. So it seems like they'd be able to do it unless they had a scope. Have any scopes on no, yeah, um, so typically the military didn't issue scopes. I don't remember exactly what year those came about. That's a good question. Uh, it was kind of later in the 1800s, I, I have to assume, kind of the closing decades of the 1800s. 
but I really don't know. <laughs> Anyone else? Well, thank you so much. Really <laughs> All right, thank you. We'll be here for a couple minutes if somebody has questions for you. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, thank you so much, and thanks for coming in.